answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! We are the Mad Men of Masculinity. Your home for healthy masculinity. We're just real men having real conversations for you. And we are live. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, good evening, good night. I am Kirk M. Samuels. And I am Jason B. Kendrick. And we are the Mad Men of Masculinity, baby. That's right. We're just real men. Having real conversations. For For you. For you, fool. We have a conversations for you, man. We have these conversations all the time on the golf course. Anyway. Yeah, golf course, man. That was, nice. that, was, that was a good day. The other day, man. It was, it was that was very, good, nice. very nice. I very much enjoyed Great that. Stuff, but, you know, but you know what? Yeah, we were having that conversation because you're one of the lucky ones, you know. KMS one is on the road out of single land mm -hmm. and I have been on the single land for, mm -hmm. I'm not even gonna say my age right now. Cause yeah. that's just gonna be rude. And it's gonna make me feel old, but forever. That's right. And luckily there are people out there who uh, make it their priority, make it their business, make it their passion to help those like us to get there. And I know you, and you, we need help, to. man. We yeah, we help. do. Some of us need more help than others. I ain't Why you got to be looking at me? I'm right here. Who, I can hear you. Some of us need help more than others, but uh, we all need help, man. You know, I know I need help. Man. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of needing help, I'm always out there looking and, yeah. you know, networking. You know anybody that can help us out? Man, let me tell you anybody what. Anybody that's got some information, some, some inspiration, some something to help us out? I got, I got the perfect person. Not only did this guy work with the millionaire matchmaker not only has he studied psychology he has made this his i mean he has got a system the c factor that breaks it down and i couldn't help it man i, I, I saw this dude and i'm like you were coming on the show boom. i'm kidnapping you let's do it boom and welcome to the show Mr. brandon raider Brandon, how you doing, my man? I'm doing very well, even though I'm apparently being held hostage. I know. It's going very well. It is hostage by choice. You just hostage found out you choice. can't get out. <laughs> you, you just, Tanner, lock the door. Panic he, button. <laughs> he just found out there's a reason there's no windows in this room. <laughs> he can't get out. He's no, we don't, we don't want to scare you. We just it want to make sure you got here. It is a padded room, though. So, that's because nobody can, nobody can hear you. That that was especially for you. We hey, had to Brandon, make sure nobody can hear you, man. And <laughs> you're stuck, dude. But no, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for coming. Because after hearing you, I mean, I've seen you speak a couple times, but it just hit me. I'm like, we got to have you on the show because especially when you talked about C Factor and how you do your dating coaching. I mean, break down like how you got into it, your psychology background, and and what makes you such an expert. Because I was enthralled, and I've read all the books. So my background originally in behavioral psychology, and I worked as a psychological researcher for many years, investigating how I describe it as first date to divorce date. Mm. And during this period, I also worked as a mediator for a couple's counseling practice. And this is where I collected a lot of my data, as well as conducting surveys and formal studies in the lab. And what I identified during this process was that there are four common causes for relationship dissolution. And they can be grouped into these four C's that I identified, which is what the C factor stands for. So the C factor has become a method that can help people find what I call a complete connection. And the four C's stand for compatibility, chemistry, communication, and catharsis. Mm. And throughout my process, when I was working with these couples who were in the process of dissolving their relationship or on the verge of, I found that I could group their reasons into one or multiple of these C's. And so I thought to myself, geez, someone should take an upstream approach to maybe teach people the dating skills, the interpersonal relationship skills to hopefully prevent themselves from ever needing to get to this point. Because we don't teach this in schools. Most people learn through trial and error, or they learn from the entertainment industry, or they learn from watching their primary care caregivers who also probably learned from trial and error. And so these skills are something that are important if a person truly wants to attract their ideal partner and be able to form a complete connection. So this prompted me to get involved in the happier side of a relationship, the initial stages, the dating. And so then I started working in the matchmaking industry. And as you mentioned, you know, I mentored with Patty Stinger. I worked with most of the major matchmaking companies in the U.S. on some capacity. Now, if, if people don't know who she is, 
I'm, I went to public school, so sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I, have, I, mean, I have that buffer delay. Square. If people don't know who she is or, or maybe heard that name, who who is that? So Patty Stinger is known for her Bravo show, The Millionaire Matchmaker. Gotcha. And is that in California? Yes. So Patty's primary, she actually matchmake it, matchmakes nationally. Um, but yes, it was in L.A. Um, is where her headquarters primarily is located. Nice. Nice. And so so you you did all that with her and then but then you you kind of you saw some patterns and you kind of formulized or formulized. See, I went to public school. Man. <laughs> Formulated? Form, yeah, that. Now I would formulize. I like that word. You formulize. <laughs> you can formulize if you, you want formulize to. Formulize some stuff, man, and 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 um, and you started connecting some dots. I love that, man. I love yeah. that whole concept. I was going to tell you, man, you might want to get out some paper and write some notes cuz uh, uh you, he, know, he, you know, especially where you're at right now, you know, about yeah, ready to, to hit that altar again. At, at this point, man, I if I don't have my season <laughs> in trouble dude i mean man c's i first of all i wish i would have got c's in school uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to have these c's you know down down packed or whatever and so and, is this um is this the the concept the overall umbrella concept of all this is is it is it so much um getting together or staying together or both both so the idea behind it is when someone knows how to apply these four C's in the courtship process, they can successfully shift into the relationship development phase of things and then build and strengthen their ideal relationship. And I do like to clarify that there is differences between there's differences between the courtship and the relationship and each one does require different interpersonal relationship skills and while there of course is crossover between the two where people can get their wires crossed is when they don't understand the nuances between courtship skills and relationship skills mm. yeah i can i can say that I've, I've had a lot better courtship skills yeah. than relationship skills because it seems like you know can can grab them just can't keep them. And see, that's the thing. A lot of people, a lot of, but I, I would say that's probably more common than not where mm. people can, they can get into relationships, but not stay into relationships. Yes. Well, and I have worked with people who are great at relationships, for example, like they have good professional relationships, friendships, familial relationships, and even they report that their last romantic relationship ended amicably and was positive. And even though obviously one of these four C's didn't align or maintain itself, which is the reason for the relationship dissolution. Um, overall, it was still a healthy relationship. But what I find is that when people are re-entering the dating world after divorce or say the loss of a loved one, they oftentimes apply relationship skills to the courtship and they don't understand why it's not working. Mm -hmm. And I'll hear things like people say, well, it's just dating's different than when I was last single. And I'm like, yes, it is. And they maybe, for example, will go in and with too much too soon. So when you're in a relationship, you're taught that you should be vulnerable and you should share into a lot of intimate details with your partner. But you go on the first date, you should not be sharing a lot yeah. of intimate yeah. details. Hey, little toxic dumping, yeah. how do you like that? <laughs> like, yeah. And I hear people say, well, I was just being honest. I'm trying to be authentic. Mm. I don't want to misrepresent myself. And I'm like, too much too soon? I was like, again, and the skill is vulnerability and authenticity. I'm like, and but there's a different way to apply it in a relationship and a different way to apply it during the courtship. Mm. So you're talking about love bombing, which I think uh, I have been guilty of and yeah. have received several times. You know what, man? You love bomb me. Whatever, man. <laughs> you do, man. You come on a little bit too strong. You need to calm down. Hey, you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be in the cage with me, man. Oh, you're supposed bad. to be helping me out my here. Bad. So before we get into these C's, my, my, my initial thought before we even, you know, deep dive into these are there differences between men and women when in relation to each one of the C's, generally yeah, speaking? Absolutely, yes. I would say generally that there are different ways that these manifest. There's also different ways that men and women apply these. And I want to clarify that what makes my approach different is that this is all based off of, again, research in the lab, as well as theories that have been tested in the dating industry. So when I give advice or I provide insight, it's always grounded in research and psychology. I try to avoid as much as possible anecdotal evidence unless I believe that this anecdotal evidence can be used to help clarify a concept that is rooted in psychology and research. Wow. So with your behavioral you know, psychology background, 
do you go with zodiac signs or is that just thrown out the window? I mean, are, this is one of those things where people are like, oh, well, I can't date you because you're this or I can't date you because you're that. And they, they kind of go off on these th different things. But do you find any evidence that things like your astrological sign or, you know, Chinese zodiac sign or any of these different things, you know, the star signs, does that play a factor or is that just like, mm, these are just per different personality types? Like would be there be one like, say, Enneagram or... Uh, human design or something like that they're like okay this might actually have a basis where for dating versus where it might just be woo woo absolutely actually i like to use the big five uh personality which is or also known as ocean which is openness conscientiousness agreeableness extroversion and neuroticism and the reason why i like to use this personality uh inventory is because it is the one that is most rooted in psychological research it has been shown to have statistical validity um, whereas a lot of these other um, personality typologies do tend to have less research to support them and again, it bases it a lot, a lot off of um, anecdotal evidence. Now, what I think is the most important thing here, though, is does someone believe it and do they identify? So really, it doesn't matter what personality typology they're using or whether they're using their astrological signs. If the person believes themselves to embody these attributes, that's what you want to listen for. Mm -hmm. So if you don't believe in astrology, but a person you're sitting across the table from does strongly believe in astrology, let them share with you their perspective on their personality and how this plays a role in their life, because they are going to be sharing information with you. And we all have that self-fulfilling prophecy to a certain degree. So you'll be able to ideally, as long as this person is truly aligned with who they are, you'll be able to see it manifest itself in the relationship and throughout the courtship process. Boom. Hmm. I'll tell you what, let's take an early break. Why would we take an early break? Well, just because because if we get into the first seed and we only oh, got like true. 60 seconds. We might, we might so need some more time. Yeah, let's take an early break. And then uh, and then when we come back, we'll get right into the right into the seeds. And Ready, set, man. early I, break. I, I wish I would have had a C. <laughs> I'm excited to get a C, man. If I'd have had a C, I'd have been able to play sports mm. or do a lot of stuff. But I couldn't even do any of that, man. So anyhow, we'll be right back. Mad Men and Masculinity, KLDC, 1220 AM. And we, and we do like 10 seconds of silence so yeah. you can see it so when he's editing it <laughs> make it easier can y'all hear me okay yeah I can hear yeah you. he uh he had to turn mine on for some reason i don't know if they had it turned off so i don't know i if yeah. i feel like i can only hear me through your microphones huh. like i feel like i don't know whatever which is yeah. probably good because i'm freaking too loud anyway he ran away he ran away so <laughs> we'll get back in there but yeah this is the time that you can cuss and say whatever's on your mind because this is behind the scenes so We're not, it's not mandatory <laughs> but no, you, you, see, you can pick you, your nose do whatever you want you seem much too classy for that but yeah, you know yeah, 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 yeah. We, we not so much um, i have i have used an expletive so um on air at once when yeah. i was doing a segment on a tv show and yeah. they did not invite me back yeah. so <laughs> It's like yeah. I, had, I mean it, it was twice because once I said it once and then I was like oh damn shit yeah. I, was like, I was like I'm so sorry and they're like Brandon we're live and I was uh -oh. like well yeah. um, I was like can you cut it out well it was nice knowing yeah <laughs> Facebook like, and YouTube doesn't care so much not so much FCC does they do they um, do yeah but yeah so that's it was on a live lo local it was on a local news station Ooh. I mean I was like yeah I was like Ooh. well they should they should love that because every time that happens though they get a boost in the ratings because it always goes right <laughs> always goes live on YouTube or something but well, initially you're like it's, it was an accident my bad I typically don't even swear but I will say the yeah. gentleman asked me a question that I was not anticipating <laughs> and he was like and they gave me the script beforehand of like these are the questions that are going to be asked and I was like okay great totally well prepared then he asked me this Sweet. random question and i was like oh See? damn shit oh. I was like, oh. right there's a curveball they always yeah. got their curveball all right. all right let's get into these c's all right. and we're back yep. mad men of masculinity mm -hmm. kldc 1220 a.m in maha mm -hmm. city we got brandon raider yeah. the c factor mm -hmm. behavioral scientist dating coach extraordinaire i know i just you know yeah. screwed that up but and he, promised, still he promised not to cuss on the radio. Yeah, he did. He, <laughs> did. he promised. Yeah, no, you, you seem much too classy yeah, to be man, to be worried about that. And yeah, no, the two of us, we yeah. we had to hold in quite a bit. We're surprised you came in here. <laughs> yeah, we we are the opposite of classy. Yeah. So let's get into the C factor. Yeah, Your C's. four C's. Like, what what's the first, first one? Was one was compatibility, right? 
Yes, I think com- compatibility is the key to longevity in a relationship. Mm. And when I say compatibility, this is the alignment of your lifestyle, relationship goals, and values. And the reason why I like to focus on goals is because that tells you where a person's at and where they're going. And a goal can be something that you're currently doing and plan to continue to do or something you've never done and want to do. And so when you're on a date, I recommend assessing compatibility on the first and second date. And I actually have something called a love life scoring system that allows people to objectively measure compatibility based off the alignment of their lifestyle, relationship goals, and their value system. Um, And so when you're on a date, you really want to be assessing what are your goals? Like, what does your lifestyle look like now? Where do you see it going? What is What do your relationships look like now? What do you see for your ideal relationship vision? And again, if th- this tells you where a person's at and, and where they're going, and if you're in alignment, then maybe you two can head that direction together. And what I found is in a lot of relationships that were, that failed, that compatibility was one of the biggest breakdowns. And oftentimes people are looking for chemistry Mm -hmm. or at least the one component of chemistry, which is initial attraction. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they base whether or not they should invest in a person off of initial attraction. Mm -hmm. And that can take you only so far. And there's a lot of research to show that there are key dips in everyone's relationship when this chemistry dips because that initial attraction is regulated by dopamine. Mm -hmm. And so when you meet someone and their strong initial attraction, your brain is being flooded with dopamine. And so again, there's these key points throughout a relationship when it begins to dip. And if there is no solid foundation of compatibility, when that dips, it's going to collapse. Yeah, so we, it's like 18 months, right? Uh, 18 minutes for some people. <laughs> I don't know. The key dip, so <laughs> there are it, three months oh, is when there's oftentimes a dip. Um, there's also another dip around the year mark. Then there's another one, seven years, the seven-year itch. Seven years, yeah. And then around 20 years. And this oftentimes happens when the kids are going off to college. Mm-hmm. And so people realize that, you know, they are maybe don't know the person anymore. I'm tired of you. with a stranger. <laughs> so it, it sounds like uh, a couple things. It sounds like when you talk about compatibility, you're not necessarily talking about um, assessments, Myers-Briggs, Enneagram. You're not necessarily talking about overlapping that you're talking about just kind of some of your philosophy kind of things your way of thinking and and your thought process you're talking about those kind of things in terms of compatibility 100 percent. so i'm glad that you brought this up because a lot of people do like to use those personality typologies to try to assess compatibility but the problem with this is that two people can have differing personalities and still be a great match Mm -hmm. But if they do not have things in common in terms of their values, their lifestyle, and their relationship goals, that will be a bad match. For example, let's say that two people are avid hikers and they both love to hike. Let's say that one person is a little bit more detail-oriented, the other person is more creative and less detail-oriented. Now, if they were basing compatibility off of these personality traits, they would say, we're not a good match. However, if they base it off of the alignment of a lifestyle goal, which is the passion for hiking, now let's say they're in a relationship and they're going hiking. The person who is detail-oriented is going to map out when they should leave based off of traffic. They're going to map out the hike that they should do. They're going to pack the essential items that they need. The person who's more creative might pack a really nice picnic. Maybe they bring a camera because they plan on collaging um, their trips together. And then maybe while they're hiking and they're on this path, they decide, hey, let's be a little bit spontaneous. There's a beautiful spot I just saw over there. Maybe that's where we go have our picnic. So you can see where these disparate personality traits can actually work in synergy to create a really harmonious relationship when that compatibility of lifestyle is present. Yeah, I like that you said that because I was thinking harmony because that's part of that opposites attract thing that we've talked about a lot is that the masculine and feminine dynamic and all these, you know, the different personality types, like having those opposites is sometimes a good thing when you find the harmony. But like you said, having that foundational, you know, lifestyle goal or choice or the that compatibility that way makes a difference. And this is how this I, I'm, I'm, I'm living this as we're speaking here. You and I talked about <laughs> yeah. this a little bit at golf and that we are 
we meaning myself and my fiance, as we are about to get married here in the very near future, we're also planning a move, you know, moving in, uh, moving in together. So we're physically moving one household, well, two households into one. And so as we're in this moving process, you know, we had this moment where, you know, she was kind of having a meltdown just with the overwhelmed and just the the story of what's going on and moving out and the daughter's moving this way and this and that and packing up and this is, you know, and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. But um, <laughs> but we need some boxes, right? We need to fill up these boxes. We so what you're go. saying is you're the detail one. Well, I, it's like one of us can be, you know, be present in the story, but at the same time, it takes another one of us to keep, you know, moving right. forward towards the goal. But either way, the mutual goal is the move. And so, to your point, we had alternate, you know, sides of the equation in terms of personality. But they came together in balancing each other. When you begin to have these conversations about compatibility, and you talked about initially in the, you know, in the, in the early dates and that kind of stuff, like break it down for the, you know, for the public school guys. When do you have these conversations and where? Like first dates. What do first dates look like? Do you like give them the form? Do you go to? <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you, is there a sheet? That Here, you fill this out. Or do you go to Starbucks and like? I mean, how does somebody? How does somebody do this? So. I have something I call the exclusivity formula, and it's date one to the only one. And what I do is I map out what should be happening on dates one through six, what information you should be collecting on each date, and then also what should be happening in between the dates. And so for date one and date two, I recommend assessing compatibility. And what I recommend people doing, and I actually have a worksheet that I I provide them to create these uh, compatibility tests, um, is that you create a primary list and a secondary list. The primary list, these are things that are most important to you. Consider these like your deal breakers. The secondary list, these are things that they're not absolutely necessary, but it would be nice if there was some alignment there. Then what you do is you take this primary list and you create stories around these values and these lifestyle goals. And so let's say one of your values or your lifestyle goals is living a lifestyle of adventure then you would get specific, well, what does that mean to you? And maybe to you, adventure means traveling internationally a couple times a year. So then you turn it into a story about maybe a trip you took to South Africa last summer. So then when you're on date one, you tap into that primary list and you tell those stories on the date. And the key is to pay attention to how the person responds because responses tell you a lot more than when someone is contributing to a story than when someone is responding to a direct question. Mm. Um, Reason being, there's something called the social desirability response. And this is something that is inculcated in us from childhood. So think back to grade school, your elementary teacher asks you a question, what goes through your head? What do they wanna hear? What's gonna get me a gold star? What's not gonna get me in trouble? Your parents ask you a question. What do they want to hear? What's not going to get me in trouble? Interview, what do they want to hear? What's going to get me the job? So throughout multiple areas of our life, we're taught to give the socially desirable response when asked a direct question. And this also manifests on a date. Now, of course, some people lie intentionally, but what I have found is that a lot of people default to this thinking without it being intentional. And so when you tell a story, you're telling your story about South Africa, do they start to contribute to it? Can they relate to it? Can they connect to it? If so, it's obviously in alignment. And even better, it helps to start generate chemistry because a lot of people report that when they're feeling chemistry on a date, they have conversational flow. It's this natural segue and back and forth without having to ask a bunch of awkward questions or to keep the conversation going. Um, So that's really the best way to assess compatibility. And then the secondary list, well, that one is for your second date because those things are important, but not absolutely necessary. Yeah, if that girl don't like my story, she ain't getting a second date. (laughs) I'm telling you what. It was chemistry the second C? That's right. Okay. So so then how does that factor in? See, you are a good student. Look at you. Check you out. I had to develop how to listen (laughs) because I couldn't read and write. (laughs) Well, chemistry is the bane of the dating world right now Mm -hmm. because, again, this is what everybody's looking for. Everyone wants to go on that first date and feel off the charts chemistry and sparks, fireworks, all the things. Um, But it's really the most unhealthiest and unproductive way to date. So 
I first want to start off by saying that people don't fully understand what chemistry is. So from a psychological perspective, chemistry is composed of three main systems, and they're each regulated by different hormones. So the first system is sex drive, which is what it sounds like. It's the urge to have sex, which then drives you to go out and seek a mate. And this is regulated by estrogen and testosterone primarily. Then we have our second category, and this is attraction. And this is, of course, what people are typically referring to when they say, I didn't feel the romantic chemistry, the sparks of the fireworks. Attraction is regulated by dopamine. Um, and the third system is attachment, which is primarily regulated by oxytocin. And so when I refer to chemistry, I'm looking at all of three, all three of these components and trying to understand how the sex drive is impacting someone's dating and relationships, how attraction is interfering or strengthening someone's dating and relationship, and how attachment influence it, influences it as well. So with like the different attachment styles, like, you know, there's stable, was it anxious avoidant, um, what, yeah. what are the other all ones? Those. All yeah. those. Yeah. How, how do those play into, because I know, like, in my experience, a lot of times, like I said, you know, getting a date or finding a girlfriend isn't that hard. But then when it gets to the intimacy side, and then I think I was, like, an anxious avoidant is something I'm working on because of just how I grew up. And, the, the like you said, those when I got asked questions, I wanted to be good, be the good boy and, and not get in trouble. And so some it didn't pave the way for me necessarily to be as open and honest and forthright as I should be. So getting to those those points when you look at okay now we've gone through the first few dates now we are, are want to get serious and, and get into the relationship and the intimacy portion is that a whole nother section with you to get into that or is that like the third seat it's like so attachment begins to play a role when in the courtship process and there are ways to i that i recommend people to identify what someone's attachment style might be but given that oxytocin can take longer to develop and also serotonin it plays a role in this as well. And so those are more of your long-term ter hormones. Um, there are ways to strengthen them and to build them throughout the courtship process. Um, and actually by the sixth date, I, I recommend people really feeling out where they're at with the oxytocin level and with serotonin levels um, by engaging in sex or copulation. And some people are like, oh, well, that's a really long time to wait. Um, <laughs> so, but it, I wasn't going to say nothing. But <laughs> no, I was trying to stick with that third day rule or something. The, but with that said, like there are ways that you can be mindful of what someone's attachment style might be so that you can approach it strategically throughout the courtship process. They do play more of an important role when two people are deciding whether or not they should be exclusive, which, as I said, is something I recommend to do by the sixth date. And the reason why I, I recommend not having sex or you know, copulating until the sixth date is because men and women, and this is more for heterosexual heterosexuals, men and women, they they do their bodies respond differently mm -hmm. when they have sex, and so actually, <laughs> I'm going to get a little bit maybe explicit here, but yeah. um, oxytocin is actually one of the hormones involved in helping a man get an erection, mm -hmm. and so you know, women oftentimes report like, oh, he just wants to sleep with me, and that's why he's being so affectionate and touchy feely and wants to be around me all mm -hmm. the time. So to a certain degree, yes, that's true, and, and the reason why men are feeling this way it, before sex happens is because they're turned on, but that's also because oxytocin is being produced. And so there really is a genuine desire to connect, to bond. Mm -hmm. However, when a man ejaculates, then the oxytocin dips. And so there's a reason out. why a man, there's actually a physiological remission mm -hmm. that men encounter, which is oftentimes why they don't like to cuddle or be super affectionate um, after sex. And it's something that I've heard a lot of men say that they need to actually have had to work on with their partners. Mm -hmm. um, and so for women, their oxyto oxytocin levels go up after having sex. Mm -hmm. So you can see this clear misalignment and there's a reason why there's stereotypes about how men might dip after mm -hmm. having sex and the woman then bond, bonds and gets attached. So I think that there needs to be a certain level of actual measurable attachment which will happen throughout the six dates. Yeah. 
Well, Man, speaking we, speaking of uh, taking a break after, uh, yeah, <laughs> we better take a break we right take now. Some remission right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna remit to a break. I need a towel. Come yeah. on. So uh, we're gonna take a break. A little nap. Mad Men of Masculinity, KLDC. We'll be right back. That one was like way long. Yeah, <laughs> I got so distracted. Oh, I know. <laughs> I was like fifteen and a half minutes. I, I was, I, was like, I, I kept looking up at you. and I'm like, well, he ain't said nothing I yet. Was like, <laughs> I was like, all into man. I was yeah. I was, yeah he, he's in the zone right now. I, I was, man. Oh, and I didn't cut you off. I saw I had to mute your microphone because if both of ours are going, it echoes. Oh no problem. So I, I muted I muted yours and I was like, okay, good. Cause I have to go back. It might be echoey in the first segment, but. It's all it's all good. We, yeah, we man, figured I, this I out. I was just like, oh. Then I was like, don't. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, all good. Oh, that's good stuff, man. I'm, I'm sure Tanner will, will, will squeeze it down. He'll yeah. speed it up. What's your see? That's why we did a short. See, that's why we short. Yeah, I did a short. See, see, yeah, I know see, you. See, I know the see, man. I'm on this man. <sighs> I'm on this man. You did, you did good work. Yeah. You did good work. We still that's, why, that's why you're my partner. Yeah. You keep, you keep it live. So you need balance. See, that's what we're talking about. So you, so you need, need balance. balance. You need balance, balance. in that whole thing. Mm-hmm. And, and you, need, you, know, you need to stop love bombing me, too. Hey. <laughs> right. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, we are back. Yep, that's right. Hey, and, how, how about your boys, by the way? Yes. Uh, you know, madmanradio.com. You make, can check us out on YouTube, Facebook. Make sure you like and subscribe. Hit that bell icon on hey, YouTube. We are listener supported, but we don't yeah. we don't we don't want you to send no money. We just want you to hit like and yes. subscribe. That's it. We'll take care of it from And there. if you're listening to us like the FCC Airwaves, if you actually know yeah. what a radio is still and you're in your car listening to us, yeah. go check us out on Facebook. You see what we look like, see that we got faces for radio and voices for print. You and got uh, that right. you know, <laughs> we say, are, man. What? I was talking about myself. That was an internal dialogue right, right there, yeah. externally. Sure. But we got Brandon Raider in the house, and we are learning so much. I, I'm, I'm mad I didn't bring my notebook. I'm but. telling you, man, this la- I, man, I just got completely spaced out. Yeah, that last, last segment, segment was, was went like, a little bit long. I was like, yo, all right, we just going to keep on going here, man. <laughs> you know, we just going to go ahead and blow past that break. That's good stuff, man. Because when you get into, like, the, you know, for me, I'm all about that. When you start talking about the oxytocin, you start mm-hmm. talking about, you know, the, the dopamines and then, you know, the serotonins and, you know, you didn't even get to like endorphins and all that kind of stuff, all the short term chemicals, the longer term chemicals and the way, you know, men bond, the way women bond and all that kind of stuff, man. That's, you know, that that's the stuff that we included even even in our book about it all. Yep. So I, I'm all about that, man. I love that kind of stuff, man. So uh, but we got through we got, we got through, through compatibility two. and we got through chemistry. Yep. Chemistry was kind of deep, man. Yeah. That was like a chemistry lesson. Well, that's one. That's one. That, we, I mean, we, we talked need like about some lab coats in here, yeah. some 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 goggles and. Some well, I, I, li- I like that he gets the science behind yeah. it and the hormones because you know we talk about you know slow down, don't let the fireworks you know burn down the house and right. all that stuff. But it's nice to have some you know that yeah. that background where it's like oh no, there's chemicals involved. Well, here. because there's a lot why. of people get addicted to the fireworks mm-hmm. and and they don't they don't try to build the campfire. Yeah. Now every campfire starts with a spark, right? Yeah. I mean, you need something to to start the campfire, but. The campfire is the longevity. See, it ain't a marathon. I mean, it is a marathon. It ain't a sprint. And so, you know, a lot of times in our culture, man, we're just so dopamine driven that we don't even realize that even in relationships and dating, man, it's like, I need the dopamine hit. I need the dopamine hit. And it's like, no, man. But they want you, you know, and we'll get into the third C now because, I mean, that's communication, right? And that's how you keep those things you remember going. that you remember communication i did well you know i'm a communication person like that's wow. that's that's always on my head i'm like i need to understand and be understood so, so you're saying we need to talk yeah let's talk brandon can, that's brandon, right. can we talk that's that right that out, man. so in communication there's a lot of different components to the communication so what i tell people to focus on is their love languages the five flirting styles which is not as well known but there's a researcher what are those? So there's a researcher named Jeffrey Hall, and this concept is very similar to the five love languages, um, where for flirting to be successful, it has to be reciprocated. For it to be reciprocated, you need to be flirting in the same style. Um, Or you you go to jail or get canceled. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, and so it's it's very – but I find that the five flirting styles are much more important in the courtship process than in the – the it's important actually in the relationship too, but then – the five love languages, yes, it plays a role in the, throughout the courtship process, but it's less important, say, on like the first three dates when you're really focusing on is there chemistry here? Am I mm-hmm. feeling it with this person? Flirting is really what's going to help spark with that initial spark that you were just talking about. Here's the most important thing I'm going to say today. The only difference between a guy that is a stalker and a guy that's really romantic is whether you think he's cute. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. That's what it breaks down to. At least with the ladies. Period. 
Yeah. I mean, the, so so communication though. So you, you you talked about communication. So you're saying flirting is a form of communication? Absolutely. Wow. I think it's what keeps the relationship. It, it's what gets the courtship going and what mm. keeps the relationship alive. So we got to keep flirting. Yeah. Absolutely. And mm. so on top of that, I also think it's imperative to look at the conflict management style. Um, so a lot of people don't pay attention to what someone's conflict resolution style is. And obviously conflicts can either make or break a relationship. I always tell people that there's this big fallacy out there that happy, healthy, long-term relationships are devoid of conflict, but this is incorrect. They're full of conflicts. The difference is how you approach it. So when people approach conflicts as opportunities for growth, it can build the relationship. So people should stop avoiding conflicts, <laughs> which is a popular, con which is a conflict, popular conflict. Uh, conflict avoided is a very popular conflict management style. Yeah, that was something I kind of got into because there wasn't any really discussion or conflict like resolution like when i grew up and like my per you know primary caregivers my parents and all that i didn't see them fight ever so i just didn't have that experience and so they're not going out into the world having trying to have relationships and it's like why are you yelling i don't want to fight and got conflict avoidance so now like i'm, I'm very upfront like we can discuss anything as long as you keep a, a level head and we, we're not screaming but i think maybe to your point that's very much how you you know deal with the conflicts because I have heard from a lot of my friends who are happily married and are doing well it's like once they figured out how to, to deal with their conflicts and, and have those discussions it's like okay well we got through that what else can we get through then it seems like that's what really builds the relationship absolutely and then of course there is the level of self-disclosure vulnerability these are components of communication as well and then also, I would say the cadence of someone's communication, and this is really important in the courtship process when people are establishing communication patterns. How frequently do they text you? Do they want text or phone calls? Do they want to limit communication over technology and, so that they have more to talk about when you're actually on an in-person date? You know, there's a lot of assumptions that other people's communication pattern is like mine. And so if they're not texting me when I would text or as quickly as I would respond, there's a disconnect here. They're not interested in me. And then the other person can say, wow, they're too intense. They're too much. Like, I, I, I'm too busy. It's overwhelming. And then they run the other direction. So it's really important to try to understand that everybody has a different cadence in their communication style and including through technology and that in the initial stages of dating in that courtship period, you're establishing a pattern. And if there is a disconnect or a misalignment with your pattern, then you need to address this conflict <laughs> with yeah. a form of collaboration and, and also be vulnerable and express when I don't hear from you when I, for more than 24 hours after I have texted you, it makes me feel like this. And could we come up with a pattern that works with your schedule, but also helps fulfill my need of feeling like we're staying connected in between in-person dates? Okay. Billion dollar question, first date. All right, here, you know where I'm going with this. Billion dollar <laughs> question, after the first date, who reaches out and when next? men should reach out to the woman it's just a it's a standard right now um and 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 it's something that women are waiting for i hear it from every female client that i have that they are always waiting for the man it doesn't mean that they won't message him it doesn't mean that they won't take initiative when they really like the guy but it does interfere with the courtship process and it does cause them to shut down a little bit more. Um, it also builds up resentment with a lot of women. And so if you are a man and you're interested in the woman, then just text her after the first date. How, how, <laughs> how soon? Yeah, how, how, how long? When? Okay, so <laughs> hey, I go. do not like to play games, but unfortunately, to a certain degree, <laughs> dating is a game. Mm. And as we talked about, Dopamine plays a big role in these initial stages of dating. And so there are strategic ways to tap into those dopamine hits. So as long as your intention is noble and you truly do want to get to know this person, then this technique is okay to use. I recommend 
24 hours, not a full, it doesn't have to be a full 24 hours, within 24 hours, but it shouldn't be right after the first date. Reason being is that you should be communicating on the date whether or not you're interested in them and whether you want to see them again. So you don't need to say that again 30 minutes later, oh, I really enjoyed our time together. I'd love to see you again because you should have said that all on the date. Mm. And a lot of people feel like it's obligatory for them to send a message, hey, got home, enjoyed our time together. But our brains crave closure. And so when we don't get a text message or that closure text for the first date, what are we doing? We're thinking about that person. We're waiting for it. And so you begin thinking about that person overnight. And so that's what you want. You do want them thinking about you. You want them obsessing about you a little bit because that's what's going to get them excited to get to know you and to move through the courtship process. But when you move beyond 24 hours, it does seem like you're playing a game. It can create a disconnect and irritation. So they get really excited when they get a text, let's say the next morning, and you say something like, hey, beautiful, really enjoyed our time last night. What's your availability this upcoming week? Dude, write that down. The force is strong in this. (laughs) (laughs) Write that down. I'm digging this whole thing, man. So, yeah, I mean, when it comes to communication, you know, especially in the dating, because I know your point, it makes so much sense, because, like, when I get excited or I'm texting with somebody, I like to keep it going. I like to keep it fun, keep it fresh, but then people have different styles, so it's nice to know that, okay, if they're not responding, they may have nothing to do personally. It's just they're busy or they have a different cadence. So that's something good to keep in mind. I found more often than not in the dating world when I was in the dating world. I'm not anymore, <laughs> just for the record. All right, Starbucks King. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, dude, I had a whole lot of stars at Starbucks. Man. <laughs> I was drinking for free for a long time, dude. Just, you know, so yeah, they knew me when I <laughs> I didn't have to tell them my name. They just wanted to know the other person's name. Anyhow, uh, but I'm past all that. But I found anyway back then that, that generally speaking, um, women didn't like a whole lot of text messages particularly early or earlier in the process. In, in other words, it, it became a, a, almost a turn off. Even if they were responding, even if they were going back and forth, it seemed like after a while it became a turn off with most of the communication, especially like like all day during the day and all mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I don't know. That was just something that I experienced. I don't know if that's universal across the board, but that's definitely something that I experienced. I hear it from both men and women. It's So in marriages or relationships, there's a well-known phenomenon called the pursuer distancer dynamic. The what? Say that again? Pursuer distancer dynamic. And Mm. so the idea is that there's always a pursuer and there's always a distancer. And in a healthy relationship, this is present in most relationships, but in a healthy relationship, it kind of flips the roles, like where it's not one person isn't always the pursuer, one person isn't always the distancer. Because when you do have that uh, fix those fixed roles that becomes problematic and can really to lead to relationship dissolution. So this is very well researched, but it's not as well researched in the courtship process. But I have found that it's still present. And to your point, there's going to always be a pursuer and a distancer to a certain degree. So the person who's texting more and pursuing more, oftentimes the other person will then become the distancer, um, which is why I do think it's best to limit the amount of texting in between the dates and they should primarily be used for logistics for planning the next in-person date and you can send what I call a top of mind text where maybe in the middle of the week you send a text message to the person just saying hey thinking of you looking forward to catching up with you this Friday just touching base being top of mind and so this one creates excitement two it doesn't establish an unrealistic communication pattern, which let's face it, sometimes people can be super distant in the beginning and then you get in a relationship with them and then they're communicating with you all the time and they want responses right away. Or like, for example, in my own relationship, um, I used to be have daily texts with my partner and now I don't respond to him for days. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like, yeah, we've been there done yeah. that. Like, yeah, but yeah. so I kept like, why didn't you respond? Why didn't you send me a message? Why didn't you respond to I me? I was doing stuff. I was doing stuff. Yeah. I'm busy now. I'm going to see you later tonight. Yeah. So I didn't see the point. Now, is there some, any truth in Because I have heard this. I know it's maybe part of like the game and all the, the, the pick up pool, pick up artist stuff like that. But because a lot of times attention is love or attention is kind of what the ladies are craving, rationing that out especially in the dating is that something you would or is that or is that or is that or is that game is that is that bad i think that it is strategic to ration it out essentially because there are a lot of there's a lot of 
concern out there about love bombing or mm. about like narcissists. And I hear this from women a lot where when a man does come on too strong initially, even if he's genuinely interested and not a narcissist at all, uh, they still, it sends up a caution sign for them. Um, and then also when you allocate it, you know, and you, like you said, you ration it out, it does build that slow burn, which is what you want. You want a slow burn, not a crash and burn. Nice. I like that. Boom. Hey, no can, crash we, and burns. can we get our last C after the, after the break here in this last segment? Let's do that. As long as it's not crashing, bro. As long as it's not crashing, for sure. <laughs> Mad Men of Masculinity, KLDC, we'll be right back. Boom. Already on the last segment. I'm telling you, man. Feels by so fast. And I'm just like, man, I'm, I'm so... He's just soaking this up. I'm He's just, you, like, man, soaking it up. This is like, dude, I mean... Yeah, I'm gonna need that. I'm gonna need that. Uh, the the question worksheet. I'm gonna need the story <laughs> uh, guideline. <laughs> I'm gonna need all that. We're yes, back. we are. That's right. That's right. We are back. Mad Men of Masculinity on KLDC. KLDC and on the interwebs everywhere. Yes. This is JBK, yeah. and that is KMS One. Yeah. If you were listening to the uh, very first segment, you'll know that this person in studio is now our prisoner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> padded walls, no windows. He didn't know he was kidnapped. Well, he, he um, has he has all the answers to all our questions dude, that we wanted yeah. to ask, so uh, we had to have him in here. at this point. First of all, before we even get into this last segment, so that we don't cram it in at the end, if folks want to get a hold of you, how do they get a hold of you? You can connect with me on Instagram at Brandon Raider Official, or you can also visit my website at BrandonRader.com. Now spell your name because it's not traditional. So B R A N D A N R A D E R. Yeah, I'm oh. so glad I caught that that it was A N because <laughs> yeah. I almost had an O N in there before, and I was about to post it all over the internet, and I'm like, I'm about to get yeah. in Happens trouble all the time <laughs> we're gonna, we gonna drop that again here at the end here. but so let's get into this last c what's the last c i forgot catharsis catharsis oh. Ooh. Oh, yes okay. so catharsis the release of past relationship Ooh. trauma and oh. drama oh i need some of that oh preach Dude, come on you just pour some tabasco on that <laughs> <laughs> it is one of the hardest ones to achieve because a lot of people don't know how to release past relationship trauma and drama, and they're oftentimes working it out throughout the courtship process and throughout their relationships, which usually works against them. And so it's really unfortunate when they do meet someone that they feel has real potential and they try to work out their past relationship trauma and drama or aren't even aware that it's manifesting and it ruins the relationship or the courtship. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've talked to quite a bit about that. It's like, be careful, you know, make sure you're doing the work to heal some of your traumas and some of the past stuff, because, you know, you can bleed on somebody who didn't cut you and ruin a good thing, you know, or you're making the next person pay for the last person because you didn't take the time to, to heal those things. And I mean, and it happens. Sometimes it happens surprisingly. Like I had a big reaction to uh, an event with somebody I was hanging out with. And then I realized it was like a trigger from like childhood. Like the first heartbreak, it just reminded me of that. And then I, I overreacted. And I was like, oh, that was a bit much. Dude, by far, most people should not be dating. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean that. Like, by far. I mean, I'm talking you just want to stay in overwhelming home? amount of people should not be dating right now. Especially folks up in our 40s and plus and 30s and all that kind of stuff. Because we got some junk in our trunk and we haven't unpacked that. I mean, and if you don't unpack your, 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 uh, your baggage, it becomes luggage. And so we just take that from relationship to relationship. We travel and we add stuff to it. And, um, you know, if you got trust issues, you're probably not ready to date. Because mm -hmm. if you got trust issues, you're probably not trustworthy. I mean, if you got, you know, all kinds of, you know, different abandonment issues and all that kind of stuff, you know, that's going to manifest in some kind of way. So, so many people need to do the work before they even get out there and start dating. But they want to go date because they're lonely and bored and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they just want to fill that that space, man. So catharsis, man, that is how, so huge. How would you guide somebody through catharsis? Yes. Like if they, because I mean, somebody's gonna hear this and go, "Oh, I need that." So I actually have a program called the Thirty Day Breakup Comeback, mm. and it the best the concept is that the best part of a bad breakup is the comeback. And so people can achieve this within thirty days, and there is powerful tool within this there's a lot of them but one of my favorites is the empathetic eliminator and so you can use empathy to eliminate some past relationship drama and trauma 
And this is one of the hardest things to do. But the idea is that you want to be able to empathize with your people from your past, whether it's familial, platonic, or romantic, those past relationships that maybe didn't end so well. And because when we have the ability to empathize with people who we deem did us wrong, it gives us the ability to forgive them, to understand where they're coming from. And there's this philosophical concept that this is predicated on, and it's called Sonder. And Sonder is the realization that every other person is going through their own unique human experience. And so let's say, for example, that one of your exes cheats on you. And so now you're carrying this with you, and maybe you're with a new person, and they are checking their phone late at night, and that's a trigger for you. And you're like, they're cheating on me. Their phone went off late at night. Who's texting you right now? Right? So you're, you know, you're taking it, the baggage out on the new person. Um, so if you maybe understand why your ex cheated, not saying that it's that you should justify it, but if you understand it, you can forgive them and not necessarily for that person's sake, but for yourself and understanding that they were going through their own issues, right? Their own human experience. They had their own whole life before you and whatever happened led them to become the type of person who cheated. And you were simply a bystander in their own emotional and psychological battle. And so if you understand that, gosh, you know, this person wasn't trying to hurt me. They weren't cheating on me intentionally to try to destroy our relationship. Because I'll tell you, most people who cheat, that's not the reason why they're cheating. And if you understand that, then you can say, you know what? I forgive them. They are a human being going through their own journey. And I was a bystander in their trauma or their own psychological battle. And we're moving on from it because it's not right. But I can forgive them as a human being. It sounds like what we see a lot, and I think one of the reasons Kirk was talking about, you know, you should not be dating right now because people aren't dealing with their traumas, Well, they tend to attract the same person that's on that same level. So they are on this vicious cycle of, of like basically trauma mating because you're because <laughs> you're not dealing with it and healing it. So it's like you bring that person in, then you have this self-fulfilling prophecy of, oh, everybody cheats on me. Well, you keep resonating with and attracting the person who has that trauma because it resonates with you. And it's like that, you know, the, old, the old adage, you know, you can put – a woman in a room with a hundred men and one of them is their perfect partner, but, or 99 of them is her perfect partner. And then one of them's like the one that resonates with her trauma. She's going to go beeline for that guy every time. And it's kind of like, when we don't do that work for ourselves and we don't realize that we need to heal, we need to have that catharsis. Then we're just going to keep having the same relationship. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, um, when someone finds themselves in these patterns and these loops, I like to say that the common factor in every bad relationship that you had is you, right? And Man, so I'm sitting right here. I'm, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> fact, you're the one I'm talking to. Um, and so, <laughs> and so um, you know, and so we got to look at the, the commonality in all this. We want to look in the window, but maybe we need to start looking in the mirror. Um, and, and so, man, I love the whole idea of dealing with all that kind of yeah. stuff, man. And, you know, I've been divorced twice. And so the, for me to get married a third time, and it's her third time, so statistically speaking, there's no way we should be getting married. You know, other than the fact that we both done some deep, like we both done some serious work on us, and we understand all of the patterns that we had created, and we, we did, we're going into this relationship in a completely different way. In my case, I, I'll own my stuff. I would say, I'd like to say, not I like to say, but I was in two weddings, but I was never married. So I was never emotionally or spiritually, mentally, physically, any of those like truly attached to the other person. So to work on all that stuff is huge. I have a very challenging question for you because you are as smart as I don't know what, man. And so I'm going to throw this out there to you, Brandon. Do you think once a cheater, always a cheater? No, I do not. I think that, you know, there's circumstances, extenuating circumstances can lead to infidelity or cheating. And if a person becomes aware of that catalyst for their cheating or their infidelity, then they can address it. For example, maybe someone cheated because they were an alcoholic or they were a drug addict. And so that impacted their ability to make smart judgments. It put them in environments where they're, where sexual promiscuity was more likely. But if someone eliminates the drug addiction and the alcohol addiction, and then also going a step further, understanding why those addictions were present, 
then they can eliminate the domino effect that did lead to the infidelity. Now, if someone has a pattern of infidelity and cheating, they need to understand what is the source of this, you know, and it could be even sex addiction could be a source of it. It could be insecurity. It could be fear of commitment. But if someone does identify the source for the cheating, then I do believe that they can resolve it and be faithful in future relationships. I was about to lead into the whole addiction thing, too. And the whole concept of where I was going with that is people can change. Mm. You know, there's one of the reasons uh, for for my past failures in relationships was addiction. It was porn addiction, period. I mean, I was more attached to a 2D two-dimensional version of a, of a female than I was a, a three-dimensional, four-dimensional version. And so, but at the same time, I also used to poop my pants. <laughs> All right. I don't do that anymore. I've, I've grown out of that. I've matured out of that. That doesn't work. No longer serves me. And so the whole idea of somebody being able to change is, is, is huge, man. And you led into that perfectly. Well, what's so interesting that you bring up, you know, porn addiction or any other type of addiction is that You know, there are primary emotions and there are secondary emotions. And primary emotions allow us to get to the core of what is causing this emotion, how we're really feeling. Secondary emotions are more of a a manifestation, a second layer to that. So for example, someone might be having a fear of loss. And so instead of say, identifying that I'm feeling fearful or afraid, they might go to a secondary emotion of I'm feeling really agitated and I don't know why. Mm-hmm. And so when you're in a relationship with someone, and this is where it goes to the communication component, when you're in a secure comfortable relationship with authenticity and vulnerability present, then people have more comfortability and ability to express that primary emotion and address the problem sooner before it manifests in unhealthy ways. Whereas if there isn't safety or comfort in that relationship, and that might not be because of the former partner, it could be because of something within you, then that person goes to a secondary emotion, which then let's say they, they seem agitated or frustrated. And then that leads them to try to mitigate mitigate that negative secondary emotion, such as um, engaging in uh, drugs, alcohol, porn, etc. And it creates this negative cycle. And so it's so important to focus on being able to tap into those primary emotions and share them. Yeah, it's one of the things, I mean, both Kirk and I have had that experience where we realized we were the uh, common denominator in both our in all of our relationships. And I know one of the things that was, I wish I had your C factor in the four C's way back when. So I could have had a better, uh, start off. I could, I could have started much better because a lot of times I would have this experience of being all in really quickly. And then once we got together and then we didn't have a good communication style, we didn't know how to mitigate our, our conflicts very well. And then it just kind of killed the romance. And then all of a sudden there was a lot of this finger pointing and projecting. And it's like, well, you were so hot for me before. What's happening now? Are you cheating? It's like, I'm stressed out. Like you're stressing me out. I don't know. (laughs) And I don't even know how to communicate that I'm stressed out. And so having something like this where you can look at it and go, let me start out this relationship or even just this dating experience with an open mind and maybe even a scientific method. I mean, because I mean, the C factor sounds like almost like the scientific method of, okay, yes, no, yes, no. Okay, this person might be a match or might not be matched and let's move it on or let's let's go for it further i gotta say randy now um, first of all i mean man yeah the force is strong like, <laughs> like seriously to be totally honest I mean, most of the people that talk about like relationship kind of stuff most of the people are like man they're full of crap right mm. dude you i mean this is like real deal stuff man and so i mean you're smart as i don't know what way smarter than me probably way smarter than jason too like you trust me you're way i'll take that than yeah him. So, man, thank you so much for coming on board, man. And thank you for sure. I mean, promise us you'll come back, man. Promise us. I mean, we, we need you back in the house at some point. And, uh, and before we go, man, again, how can folks get a hold of you? I will definitely be back. And in the meantime, connect with me on Instagram at Brandon Raider Official or my website at BrandonRader.com. And again, the spelling of my name is B R A N D A N. R A D E R. Yes, yeah, so you, you're gonna have to be our dating consultant, our relationship guru, oh, because no. I mean that knowledge is you just dropping knowledge left and right, oh, and it's no. making me go, okay, I need a whole new script. Yeah. <laughs> but until next time, make sure you like and subscribe, hit that bell icon, listen to us on KLDC Saturdays at eight, Wednesdays at six p.m., and your boys are here for you. So 
be with us. Be part of the Mad Men Mafia. Until next time. Mad Men. We are out. Out.